Hey, good morning. Uh, good to see you. Uh, this is our uh, illumination of the intent class. And um, we're going to begin with a couple of the prayers, which I think Sheila is going to put up. Right, Sheila? I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. Through the collections I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit migrating beings. The English translation says sentient beings, but in the, the last line of the Tibetan, it says drola, dro, dro, dro means migrator, or those who are going. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly through the collections I create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit migrating beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly through the collections I create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit migrating beings. By offering this ground, anointed with perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon, visualized as a Buddha realm, may all migrators enjoy the Buddha, the, the pure realm. O holy and perfect pure Lama, from the clouds of compassion that form in the skies of your Dharmakaya wisdom, please release, send down a rain of vast and profound Dharma precisely in accordance with the needs of those to be trained. Idam Guru Radna Mandala Kam Nirea Tayam He. Okay, that's it. There we go. So uh, good to see everyone. Are we having the same problem we did before? I'm only uh, I'm not able to get the the view of seeing everyone myself. Is that did you do something different? I think the last time when you did this, it was the same problem. Um, you know, I've I've spotlighted you for the recording, but if you want, I can remove the spotlight. Um, do, are you in the gallery view, and you still don't see everybody? I don't see everyone, so yeah. Can you, see, you, can you switch to gallery view? Oh, the, okay, I I see now the gallery. I hope uh, I remember someone on the on the uh, group page on Facebook group page had said. Uh, they wanted to have it spotlighted that they didn't like to see everyone's faces. Can you do the recording so that it's spotlighted, but I can see the gallery view, or is that impossible? I think, uh, Venerable, you need to change it to gallery view at your end. Like once it's spotlighted, you just uh, okay. go from I'm, speaker view to gallery view. I'm in gallery view now, so that's right. fine. So, it, it, so it's being... Let me, try it. Let me try spotlighting again. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. No, okay. I'm not sure. I, I think okay, I you're can in see gallery. the gallery. You're, so if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm spotlighted, that's fine. Okay, so let's begin uh, with a little meditation. Uh, we've said the, the prayers, the <clears throat> words, but uh, let's try to get it, you know, ex experiential. Um, well, experiential <laughs> experience. Let's try to get an experience of that. So sit comfortably. Spine straight. Watch your breathing. Pay attention to your breathing. And once you've recognized it, hold it in mindfulness. Letting go of all other thoughts.
if you notice yourself thinking of thoughts, forcefully bring your attention back to the breathing. Use all of your attention on that. Hello. Yeah, hi Pete, how are you doing? Okay. Whoever is speaking on the phone could mute. Let go of your attention, partial attention to what your eyes are. You know, the, maybe the light that's coming into your eyes. Let go of your attention to your body. And follow one breath up as though it's going to the crown of your head through your, from your nostrils down to your throat, to your heart chakra area. And give up watching the breathing, paying attention to the breathing. And instead watch your mental consciousness. Most of you have done this before, if not all of you. So if you have a remembering consciousness of the clear light nature of your mind, you can use that as a basis. Not just watching the contents of the mind, but inferring and getting a mental image of its, the mind's conventional nature is not obstructing the arising of thoughts, not obstructing the removal, the diminishing or absorbing of thoughts back into the, that nature. is something that doesn't have a color or shape, this clear light nature. It's something that's perceived with the eyes of wisdom and gnosis. In other words, it's something that's understood. A lack of obstructing, obstruction to the arisal or Removal of thoughts. This is what's called our developmental Buddha nature, the conventional pure light nature of the mind. <clears throat> <clears throat> because we have this nature that we're trying to recognize, we can get rid of all of the faults of our mind now, our, oh, our lack of empathy for others. We can actually develop good qualities. We can develop a concern for others, a, a loving kindness, a compassion for them. We can develop renunciation which pays less heed to the appearances right here and now, you know, to our, our fortune of 
having wealth or pleasure or fame or you know love and so forth we can develop an understanding of emptiness which is the aim of the text that lama so lama Tsongkhapa wrote that we're studying we can start to understand emptiness even have an insight realization of it because our mind has this clear light nature now, even people who haven't met the dharma have clear light nature of mind everyone does every sentient being but to recognize that and to recognize that we can use this opportunity now this auspicious moment where we have a life of leisure and endowment. We can use it, not just the way ordinary people do to have more pleasure or wealth or power or affection and so forth, but we can use it to develop the great Buddhist realizations, renunciation, compassion, wisdom. All of this comes about because we have this life of leisure and endowment, this auspicious moment that has come about due to our karma that we created in past lives, sometimes with great effort. Maybe we practiced morality, we practiced charity, we prayed to again be born as a human. So think, I'm going to use this portion of this life of leisure and endowment that I'm experiencing this morning, this afternoon, <clears throat> to accumulate the causes of enlightenment. Why? Because I have previously recognized the suffering nature of all living beings who have been my mother in numberless lives in the past, who are exactly equal with me and wanting to be free of suffering and wanting to be happy. Knowing that there's no legitimate reason to favor myself when it comes to adjudicating between, you know, benefiting myself and benefiting others. We all have exactly the same Buddha nature. We all have the same right to achieve enlightenment. We all have the same ability to achieve enlightenment. And sentient beings, by nurturing them, by caring for them more than myself, I create the karma to overcome my self-cherishing, my self-cherishing attitude, which is the, the, the cause of all of my suffering since beginning this time. And cherishing others creates the, the doorway to infinite happiness in that by in cherishing them, working for their benefits, I create the causes of my spiritual evolution. My achievement of enlightenment, the Dharmakaya, which is the supreme aim of myself. So thinking of others predominantly working for their welfare, I, by the way, 
without putting any special effort, achieve my own happiness. To bring about the happiness of others perfectly, lead sentient beings out of suffering into that happiness without error, spontaneously, I must achieve enlightenment myself. So think, I'm going to listen to the talk this morning, this afternoon. For that purpose, in order to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all mother sentient beings. And in this vein, knowing that I must achieve bodhicitta to achieve that goal of enlightenment, bodhicitta is the wish to achieve enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings, and the, one of the preeminent methods to develop, to augment my development of bodhicitta is the practice of giving and taking. Beginning with taking, taking on the suffering of others. Imagine taking on the suffering of others and sending out all of my possessions, my wealth, my body, my merits that I've accumulated in the past and the present, and even those merits I'll accumulate in the future, sending them out in the forms of wish-fulfilling jewels to sentient beings that transform into whatever they need. In particular, Venerable Roger Kunsan, Lama Sopa's attendant, uh, has broken his hip, I think in Singapore, and uh, in, in himself taking on the obstacles to Lama Sopa Rinpoche's well-being obstacles. So imagine taking on the suffering of Roger, his you know, the immobility, the, the, the suffering of having a broken hip. Imagine taking that on yourself, that he, that he would be free of that. And imagine sending out your own healthy body now, your possessions, your merits, arriving at Roger, alleviating his pain, bringing some pleasure. And then subsequently imagine taking on the suffering of all beings with broken hips. Even in this world, probably thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, I don't know. sending out your, your healthy body in the form of a wish-fulfilling gem toward them. Imagine all of the beings in the hell realms, hungry ghost realm, animal realm, humans, even gods, all of the Even though some of the gods have no suffering of suffering, they still have changeable suffering and certainly pervasive suffering. All these sentient beings have been our mother. And as kind as our present mother, numberless times, depthlessly kind, Imagine taking on all of their sufferings right now.
putting it on the self-cherishing thought in the center of your heart chakra. And sending out your healthy body, your possessions, your merits of the three times to become whatever they need, whether they need a friend or a nurse or a doctor, a boat to get across the ocean of samsara, whether they need teachings, friendship, whatever, food even. Take on the suffering of the Canadians in the Northeast of Canada who are experiencing the Fiona cyclone, I guess it's called now. One of our class members, Doris Tatri, all of the electricity out, trees are down around her. Imagine taking on all of their suffering. and sending out wish-fulfilling jewels to them, comprised of your own body, your possessions, and your merits of the three times. And think in order to actually be able to do that, that practice authentically, I need to understand the Dharma. So again, think I'm going to participate this morning, this afternoon in, in the class, listening, contemplating, and meditating with the end aim of achieving enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. How wonderful that would be. And then bring your attention back to the present. So, good to see everyone. Mikhail has joined us, Violet. Amy Krantz is here, Rachel, Venerable Tendron, and Venerable Pommel, Jennifer, Donnie, hello to everyone. So uh, before we begin, any outstanding questions, comments, observations? How was your meditation? Kristen's nodding. Don, how, did, you, did you meditate? Or you, did you have some other? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amy, did you meditate? I came, I came in late and I'm, I'm afraid that I can't stay the whole period. So I- Okay, no okay. problem. Okay, that's okay. But I, but the little bit I did, it was help. It really helped me to get into the space. Oh, okay, okay, that's good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay. Oh, camping. Richard, ha Richard has I, his hand. Okay, Richard, what, what, what's what's happening? I'm venerable. I'm sorry. This isn't a question um, about the Dharma. I'm just uh, concerned about Doris. Is she okay? Yeah, she she phoned me this morning. She had no internet, but she used some of her minutes. She called her daughters and her relatives first. Uh, the trees are down. Um, I can't remember her mentioning about the wind right now, but uh, it looks like uh, she's out of either, she's out of minutes or out of battery. I suggested she, <laughs> she plug her iPhone into her 
MacBook Pro because the MacBook Pro has a big battery, but she didn't think she had the right cable. So I'm, I'm hoping that she works something out. Yeah. Well, I hope she's okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna continue. Uh, we're gonna start on the, uh, at the section that says how to practice on the ordinary person's stage in particular. And just to get us up to speed, um, just before that, we finished last time, there was a, this statement uh, that uh, all of these great masters, uh, Buddhist masters who came, starting with Nargajuna, Aryadeva, Chandrakirti, Buddhapalita, Bhava Viveka, uh, Shank Shantarakshita, Kamala Shila, and so forth. We mentioned all of the books that they wrote. They all agree on the basic structure of the path, a gradual uh, path that leads to enlightenment. You know? um, and uh, the, the text said, as for a method that would easily bring forth ascertainment of these points, an approach that is most accessible for those on the beginner stage, Tukhtin Jimper translated, I have presented an approach to guiding others on the path that is extremely easy to understand in my Lanrim Chemo or in my, in my Lanrim stages of the path to enlightenment, representing the instruction of glorious Dipankara, which was the uh, one of the ordained names of Atisha, right? Dipankara most learned in the systems of the two great charioteers. Thus one can learn from there. And I mentioned that that's not exactly what Lama Tsongkhapa said. Uh, he did mention the Lan, Lam Rim, uh, uh, but Jeffrey Hopkins had translated it as the means for readily bestowing conviction in the paths and facilitating a beginner's entry into them can be known from the precepts found in the lamp for the path of enlightenment, which is not, the, the text actually says uh, the stages of the path, the long rim, by a Tisha who was skilled in the two systems of the Mahayana. So uh, neither translation has it exactly right, but they, you get the general point. Uh, Lama Sokapa was saying that uh, he's almost giving credit for the lamp of, uh, of for the stages of the path teachings that he gave to Atisha, sort of the oral precepts uh, that Atisha gave in his lamp to the path to enlightenment. Okay, so now how to practice on the ordinary person's stage in particular. So what does it mean, ordinary person? Uh, Violet, do you know what, in this context, what ordinary person means? Violet? Huh? Hey. Uh, ordinary person is... Uh... What? Ordinary I'm person? Thinking. <laughs> oh, you're thinking. Okay, you're thinking out loud. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's thinking, Violet, thinking. Uh, ordinary person, you said that those people is not on the path? No. No, not necessarily. Uh, Diana, do you know what, what's meant here? Diana Weddington? Weddington? Um, I guess I was thinking also before um, becoming an Arya Bodhisattva. There, yeah. So here, ordinary means non-Arya. So we're talking about um, essentially people before entering the path, who have developed these three special practices of compassion, non-dual awareness, and bodhicitta, uh, using that to have spontaneous bodhicitta and enter the path. So from that point when you're starting to practice all the way through the path of accumulation and the path of preparation, when you're already a bodhisattva, those are called the... Uh, stages of the ordinary persons. So ordinary as opposed to aria, aria being, right? So this is so, 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 so the question is, 
if this treatise presents systematically both the profound and the vast aspects of the Bodhisattva path, as well as their results, what are their results? Shanka, what are the results? Yeah. Profound and it presents systematically the profound and vast aspects of the Bodhisattva path as well as their results. Well, what the re results would be the 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 final achievement, right? No more learning. Right, right. Yeah, I was talking about that. Uh, which constitute the object of attainment, that is Buddhahood. Then the stages of the path from the of the ordinary person, which are so important for the bodhisattvas, because we're assuming bodhisattvas, you know, bodhisattvas on the path of accumulation and path of preparation are ordinary beings. So they're important because they, without practicing that, you can't achieve the Arya state. You can't achieve the path of seeing. Then the stages of the path of the ordinary person, which are so important for the bodhisattvas, should have been presented immediately after the salutation. This is someone's, someone's thought, right? Getting irritated. He should have said it, he should have given these things. But it is not the case. Instead, the text begins directly with the presentation of the grounds of the Arya beings. How could this be right? So, uh, little misunderstanding there. Maybe this is, certainly this is not Jayananda, this, this qualm, and this is uh, maybe some other Buddhists that were, you know, finding fault with Chandrakirti's text. So the reply, the answer is uh, that the stages of the path of the ordinary person were actually presented already in the context of the salutation verse. by presenting the three principal causes, compassion, non-dual awareness, and bodhicitta, on the basis of practicing which, this sounds a little bit, let me say, on the basis of practicing which, uh, by practicing them, uh, one becomes a bodhisattva. It was shown that those who wish to enter the great vehicle, the Mahayana, must first cultivate these three factors. Not only must these three be practiced at the outset, at the beginning, you know, before entering into the path, but once one has actually developed spontaneous bodhicitta and entered it in the path, one, once is, one is on the path of accumulation and an actual bodhisattva, one they must also be practiced even after one has become a bodhisattva. Furthermore, given that gnosis, that means that, you know, what we call uh, you know, special wisdom, you know. Furthermore, given that gnosis not tending to du duality is the principal practice of a bodhisattva, we must understand that its inclusion illustrates the need to train in the other bodhisattva practices as well. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Hopkins translates at that point. Since the wisdom not relying on duality is the chief practice, you should understand through its illustration that you should train in the other deeds such as giving. So not so clear from Jimpa, from my, my point of view, Jimpa says, we must understand that its inclusion illustrates the need to train in the other bodhisattva practices as well. Jeffrey says that taking that as an illustration, you know, that you, you should understand indirectly that the other deeds, such as the other six perfections have to be practiced. So the following pa pra passage from Nargajuna's compendium of sutras relates to this point. The uh, Sutra Samuchaya, right? Uh, can be called the anthology of sutras if you want, but usually we translate compendium. O Bodhisattva, 
do not apply yourself to the profound nature of things divorced from skillful means. For joining method and wisdom into a union is the perfect practice of bodhisattvas. And again, I'm going to, I'll do this occasionally. Uh, Jeffrey translates that a bodhisattva should not apply him or herself to the profound nature of phenomena bereft of skill and means. Jimba says divorced from skillful means. A union of method and wisdom is the right application of a bodhisattva. A union of method and wisdom is the right application of a bodhisattva. So what does that mean? When you're meditating on emptiness in the bodhisattva path, it should be held by your, your bodhicitta. It should be held by your compassion. That compassion or bodhicitta may not be manifest when you're meditating on emptiness. Well, it could be manifest if you if you have an intellectual understanding of emptiness, the uh, bodhicitta compassion method side can be manifest. But if you have a direct realization of emptiness, uh, at that point, bodhicitta, anything from the method side, anything other than the, the wisdom realizing emptiness will not be manifest. But they, you, you need to have it, uh, you need to, to apply yourself, say for instance, when you enter into meditation on emptiness, say if you're going to go into a meditative equipoise on emptiness, direct realization of emptiness, you have to make uh, a, a sort of aspiration beforehand that you will remain in that state for a limited amount of time and then ent exit that state in order to practice the method side. So when we, when we talk about method and wisdom, we talk about the accumulation of wisdom and the accumulation of merit, right? Accumulation of merit is the method side. Accu accumulation of wisdom is the wisdom side. You need both of them in order to achieve your goal. So in, from that point of view, you have to practice a union of method and wisdom. So in his commentary to that, Lama Sunkapa uh, says, you should thus train in a union of method and wisdom. Actually, Lama Sunkapa's text doesn't say that. Jeffrey Hopkins has it correct here. He says, um, you must train in a union of the two collections. Tripton Jimpa either uh, wanting to make it more simple. Tripton Jimpa says, you should, you should thus train in a union of method and wisdom. That's what the two collections means. That is the collection of wisdom is the, is the wisdom side and uh, the collection of merit is the method side. Don't be content with a partial method of, or wisdom. Do not place confidence in being satisfied with a portion of method or wisdom. that lacks any distinctive, don't be content with a partial method or wisdom, nor place your confidence in a mere single pointedness of mind that lacks any distinctive features of method and wisdom. Jeffries translates, don't be satisfied with a portion of method or wisdom or a mere one pointedness of mind that lacks special method and wisdom. So what kind of mind would that be? That would mean, uh, you know, a kind of one-pointedness of mind that lacks special method and wisdom. What do you think? 
Venerable Tendron, do you know what that, that's referring to? What kind of one-pointedness of mind that lacks special method and wisdom? It'd be a mind that's um, without bodhicitta, that's focused merely on wisdom for the sake of one's own liberation. I don't know. Uh, that could be. Or, or also one pointedness of mind, meaning, uh, you know, the what we call the mundane vipassana. Right. You know, when you yeah. <clears throat> you meditate to achieve the the first dhyana, the first form uh, realm realization, and or the second, you know, the the second form realm realization, or the formless realms, those states of mind won't lead you to Mm -hmm. uh, to liberation or to uh, enlightenment by themselves. So you should thus train in a union of method and wisdom or of, of the two collections. Don't be content with a partial method or, or wisdom, nor place your confidence in a mere single pointedness of mind that lacks any distinctive features of method and wisdom or as Jeffrey says, that lacks special method and wisdom. So the special method here would be bodhicitta, as Venerable said, and the special wisdom would be the, the wisdom that realizes emptiness. And then uh, Lama Sokapa says, uh, or as, as Jimpa translates, I noticed that some people fail to demarcate what is to be negated using reasoning that probes the nature of suchness and they end up negating everything. You know, understand what that means? You understand the words? Rachel, do you understand what I'm saying? That would be a nihilistic uh, extreme, yes? Yeah, I notice, well, it, 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 the text doesn't say, I notice, it, it says, uh, some people fail to demarcate or identify what is to be negated using reasoning that is uh, analyzing suchness. You know, some people fail to identify the object of negation, in other words. And they, and they end up negating everything. So how could they end up negating everything? They would think that uh, because that uh, because uh, you are refuting, you they 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 think some people think that you're refu refuting even conventional existence. This is a, this is a position that some people say. Lama Sonkaba made a, a point due to the advice of Manjushri that when you were refuting inherent existence. You weren't in refuting conventional existence. So, for instance, when you refute the conventionally existent, uh, when you when you refute the inherently existent I that is appearing to your mind, in so doing, you don't refute the conventionally existent I, the mere name Shanka that's given to your your body and mind, your your five aggregates. So. Um, some people fail to demarcate or identify. When we talk about identifying the object of negation, that's a better word to use rather than demarcate. What is to be negated using reasoning that, that searches into the nature of suchness and they end up negating everything. They conflate all forms of thought with grasping at true existence. So some of them would think, some uh, even Buddhists think that having any thought at all you know is uh, is accepting true existence so they would say only when you have the the gnosis that has a direct realization of emptiness when there are no thoughts present that's the only thing that's valid they relegate the entire presentation of conventional reality to what exists only from another's perspective or as Jeffrey says, um, 
they assert that all presentations of conventionalities are based only on the ignorance of others. Shanko, what are you thinking? I was going to ask a question regarding um, the previous point. Um, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, which was the one about um, not to place your confidence in me or a single point of mind that lacks any distinctive features of method and wisdom. So does that mean, for example, and you mentioned, you know, the first form realization and the second form and so forth and so on. So uh, if I were a, if I were a Hinayana practitioner and I was um, uh, meditating on, um, you know, uh, uh, on emptiness with the goal of liberation, right? I, I, I care nothing about whether or not others get there or not. Um, does that lack the distinctive? I mean, it, it, it has the distinctive feature of wisdom, but right. may not have the distinctive feature of method. So, the, so you have to have both is what he's saying. Yes, you need okay. to have a union. O oh, Bodhisattva, do not apply yourself to the profound nature of things divorced from skillful means. Okay. So in that regard, Yeah, let's see. Did I have that twice? Yeah. A bodhisattva must not join practice, must not join or must not practice profound reality. Gambira, Gambira Dharmata. Without practicing skillful means. Upaya Kaushaila. This is from uh, the Compendium of Sutras. It's a translation from uh, another lady who had translated uh, some statements about them. So the main point is that the Bodhisattva has to always be aware of having this union of method and wisdom. Even when they're entering into meditative equipoise in the, you know, for some period of time, they have to make a plan that they're going to arise from that. And when they do arise to practice the method side to accumulate merit and so forth. And they have to have, as, as Shanka mentioned, uh, say the Hinayana practitioner, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't have this um, union of method and wisdom, because they wouldn't have the uh, the special method, the special method of bodhicitta and so forth. Okay, we all on the same page. We're okay. So uh, some people fail to uh, identify or demarcate what is to be negated what, using reasoning that probes the nature of suchness, and they end up negating everything. They conflate or they mistake all forms of thought with grasping a true existence, as though any kind of thought is grasping a true existence. Like when we talked about the, uh, the debate between Kamala Shila and uh, Hashan Mahayana, I noticed on the, the, group, the Facebook group page, uh, Poon King. Uh, had mentioned that in in uh, th that that is correct. The Hashan is the what did she say is the uh, Mandarin pronunciation for uh, teacher like that. So Hashan Mahayana, uh, Hashan Mahayana was saying uh, at that time that it wasn't necessary to have any kind of conceptual thought. It wasn't necessary to practice the method side. All one needed to do is to have, you know, uh, direct realization of emptiness with no thoughts whatsoever. So that was what was being, uh, you know, foisted upon the, the Tibetans. Uh, and the, the king and the, and the assembly of people that watched that debate, it went on for many days, I think, or if not weeks, uh, came to the conclusion that the gradual path was what had to be practiced, one that, that utilized 
and, and recognize the importance of the union of method and wisdom. They conflate all forms of thought with grasping at true existence. They relegate the entire presentation of conventional reality to what exists only from another's perspective. So what that means in Jeffrey's translation, he says, uh, they assert that all presentations of conventional, 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 excuse me, they even look at it, conventionalities, you know, like we talk about the conventional self and so forth, are based only on the ignorance of others. So that for the person, they, they claim that for a bodhisattva who's realized emptiness, and in other words, who sees things as they are, conventionalities only exist from the viewpoint of the ignorance of others. They assert that on the resultant stage, I mean, Buddhahood, right? There is only Dharmakaya, by which they mean mere suchness devoid of wisdom, devoid of gnosis. So they, some people say that there is no, one doesn't even realize emptiness, you know, that there is only Dharmakaya, by which they mean mere suchness devoid of gnosis. And they say that the Buddha's form body, the Rupakaya exists purely within the subjective experience of spiritual trainees. Or as Jeffrey says, they say that at the time of the fruit, Buddhahood, there is nothing else except the truth body, Dharmakaya, which is mere suchness devoid of wisdom. They also assert that form bodies are included within the mental continuums of trainees, that form bodies you know, the Buddha's form bodies, the Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya don't exist uh, outside, you know, as, as objective objects, but they only exist from the perspective of the trainees. Shanka, what are you thinking? So is this, is this related to the lower tenets, uh, Buddhahood without remainder and so forth and so on? Is that what it's referring to? No, it's referring to uh, misinterpretations of Madhyamaka by other Buddhist scholars, especially the ones, you know, the ones that Lama Sokaba is aware of in Tibet. Uh, but they were also in India also, that would say that uh, when you achieve enlightenment, uh, there's no realization. You're, it, it's just pure suchness. Um, from Lama Sokapa's point of view, interpreting Chandrakirti and Nargajuna, the Buddha's wisdom exists. We call it the wisdom dharmakaya that realizes emptiness. And the Buddha's, uh, from the Buddha's uh, mind can emanate the nirmanakaya, the emanation body and the sambhogakaya with the intention of, you know, benefiting sentient beings. The Buddha doesn't necessarily think about things in the way that we think about things like, oh, what should I do today? How can I help that person? Uh, the Buddha's mind spontaneously emanates these things uh, in accordance with his omniscient mind or her omniscient mind. Richard. Uh, yes, Venerable. I was just wondering, um, this whole passage, it makes me think of um, the mind only school of Chittamatra. Um, and I was just wondering if that was a reasonable, you know, whether or not that was re accurate. Uh, I, I think Chittamatra and uh, what, what do we call the Yogacara, you know, and another often synonyms, but sometimes slightly different interpretations. They do accept uh, the existence of these, um, uh, you know, of the need for union of method and wisdom, and they do accept that there is a conventional reality, generally. This is talking about some aberrant uh, Majamaka scholars who are trying to explain 
<clears throat> what the Buddha meant and, and trying to explain Nargajuna in ways that do not accord with his actual intention. Okay. I think I understand. It's just that when it says the Buddhist form body exists purely within the subjective experience of spiritual trainees, it sounds like what it's saying is, is that there is no um, existence to the to the Buddhist form body outside of the mind. Yeah, that part oh, could be mind. applied. That part could be applied to Chittamatra or Yogacara in that uh, from the perspective. Uh, but but still, Yogacara still has to deal with the ex, with the existence of the outer tree, right? So other people also see the tree, even though the tree uh, is. The, is it your perception of the tree, the appearance of the tree to your mind is, is existing not as an external object, but is as a nature of your own mind, right? From the Yogacara point of view, the Chittimata point of view, when we say mind only, that means uh, if you just talk about one person's experience, if I see the tree, which you often can see in my glasses out my windows there, I, see, I heard. Um, if I see the tree, that tree doesn't, from Chittimatra point of view, that tree does not exist as an external object. The appearance of that tree arises from the ripening of karma on my uh, alaya vijnana, my foundation consciousness. Uh, when both the cognizer and the cognized arise together, that is the, the wisdom or the, the mind that's seeing the tree and the appearance of the tree both come from the same seed on my consciousness, that there are no external objects. But that has to deal that then that has to deal with the, the fact that other people also see that tree and we can have conversations about it. So that it, when you talk about Yogacara, it gets a little bit uh those 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 kinds of uh doubts or situations uh have a lot to you know you know a lot of problems in the in the chittimatra system so here's i don't think it's mainly talking about chittimatra here it's talking about even from this perspective of and like you know the wrong view of the majamaka uh that when, when, earlier when we said they end up negating everything, right? What did we say here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's no conventional truths. So there's no, uh, for them, uh, there are no, uh, the, the Buddha's body, this, the Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya, is not talking so much from the Chittimatra point of view, although that could be applied. It's talking about that, uh, that they, they don't exist as conventional things from an ultimate point of view. And uh, therefore, the perception of them by trainees who do see them, you know, or, or have, have uh, interactions with the Nirmanakaya or uh, Sambhogakaya, that it is only from their, their perspective. Um, so, so Jeffrey translates theirs. They also assert that form bodies are included within the mental continuums of trainees. Okay, so, something to think about. For those who make such assertions, all these facts, how on the basis of scriptural authority and reasoning, Shravakas and Pratika Buddhas are born from sovereign sages, from the Manindras, from the Buddhas. Buddhas, in turn, are born from bodhisattvas and so on. None of those statements will constitute standpoints of entering the middle way. So from the viewpoint of people who say that there's, uh, there are no convention conventionalities, uh, none of this makes sense. So what he's saying is that that you have to uh, you have to refute those points of view that say that there are no conventionalities at all.
Furthermore, the three factors to be cultivated would be posited merely from the standpoint of others if there weren't conventional realities, if there weren't conventionalities, right? We, we accept, Lama Sunkapa accepts the existence of conventionalities. If you look at some commentaries of the Majamaka Vatara uh, by th some Kargyu scholars, I think even translated into English, they seem to imply that they, they are accepting it that way, that there are no conventionalities. You know, the conventional truth doesn't exist. Lama Sunkapa made a point as I've mentioned several times, and the advice of Manjushri to explain the, the fact that conventionalities, conventional phenomena are validly established. Here, this other position is the position that conventional reality is not validly established. It's only an illusion, only an illusion, not like an illusion, as we say in the in the Prasangika, we say generally in the Majumika, phenomena are are like illusions. It doesn't mean that they are illusions, right? They do have some consistency, causal consistency, the the dependent arising, and so forth. So, furthermore, the three factors to be cultivated would be posited merely from the standpoint of others, and thus would not represent the Majamaka, Majamaka's own perspective. But they do. Majamaka's own perspective is that uh, these factors are do do exist conventionally. In so doing, they would be denigrating all the paths that they themselves need to practice. So this is gets back to the Hashan Kamala Shila debate, right? The, 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 it's also called the Samye debate because it took place at Samye. Has anyone anyone here been to Samye? Oh, you've been there. Oh, Snehi, you went to this. What was that, Don? Was that, was that no? I can, were you saying you'd been to Samia? No. I wasn't saying anything. Oh, oh okay. I thought you were. You're doing good. Uh, so Samia is one of the first monasteries in Tibet. Uh, what was it, Paul? Uh, Padma Sabhava? Uh, I think it was, I thought it was uh, Shantarakshita and Kamala Shila, actually. Oh, Shanka, Sh Shantarakshita. That, that's what I thought so, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Thank you for that correction. Uh, Shantarakshita uh, had this monastery. While, while he was there, this monastery was built, associated generally with the, uh, the Kargyu and, and Nyingma traditions. And uh, so in that debate that took place at Samye between Kamala Shila and Hashan Mahayana, Hashan Mahayana's position was there was no need uh, to, to practice these things, the method side. You just, you just, you know, it was just, it was almost like Dzogchen, you know, the, the, the misinterpretation of Dzogchen today, uh, the people thinking that uh, you know, you don't need to do any of these other things. You don't have to practice charity or morality. Uh, it's all wisdom. So this would denigrate all the paths that they need to practice. Moreover, all the statements about how sentient beings who lack intrinsic existence revolve in cyclic existence through six factors that parallel the features of a water wheel will become nothing but a series of contradictions. What's that talking about? That's that's obvious. We talked about before. Uh, Chandrakirti, Chandrakirti gave the example of this water wheel to explain how sentient beings circle in cyclic existence and the sufferings that they experience. They go down easily to the lower realms. It's hard to come up. They bump against the sides and so forth and so on. All of these practices, uh, all of these factors uh, would become nothing but a series of contradictions if there were no conventional realities. Recognize, therefore, that such proponents are peddling a distorted exposition of the meaning of the treatise, starting right from its salutation verses. Peddling, I like that. 
Jeffrey says, they would say that the cultivation of the three practices is posited only for others and is not the system of the Bodhisattva Majamikas. Majamikas. They're, thereby they de deprecate all paths that must be practiced from one's own point of view. For them, the explanation that wandering sentient beings who are empty of inherent existence are like buckets, are like a bucket in a well in, in six ways would be self-contradictory. Thus, you would know that from the beginning, thus you should know that beginning with the expression of worship, they have explained the meaning of the text incorrectly. Understanding that even with respect to the training in generosity and so on presented in the context of the grounds of the Aryas, there are many deeds that need to be practiced from the start, right from the level of an ordinary person, the ordinary person. That means you know, even before entering the path, we're ordinary persons, right? We, we can start practicing these practices now. We can practice generosity and morality and so forth. Uh, and on the path of accumulation and the path of preparation, we have to practice them also. We should strive to engage in the practice from this very moment. So that's a very good advice uh, when we talk about uh, all of the things that we're studying. If you, if you hear about the practices of the bodhisattvas and great beings, uh, even the practices of the shravakas and pratika buddhas, they are things that we can emulate now even if we don't practice in the same way that they are practicing. So the next section, presenting the grounds of Arya Bodhisattvas. Okay. So although there are many practices on the path of accumulation and preparation that are not found in these three practices of, uh, you know, compassion, non-dual awareness, and bodhicitta, what are those practices? The developing of single-pointed concentration, developing of a union of calm abiding uh, and penetrative insight, meditating on emptiness, all sorts of other practices that are there. Uh, generally, this, the, the, these, the practices of the ordinary beings were summarized in that salutation that said you, you needed uh, to practice these three practices. So the third outline, presenting the grounds of Arya Bodhisattvas, has three parts. Presenting the 10 grounds collectively, and then presenting the individual grounds, and finally presenting the qualities of the 10 grounds. So those would be three sections, right? So presenting the 10 grounds collectively or in common, what, you know, what features they have in, pro in common. The explanation here of 11 grounds, and I just said 10 grounds, right? The explanation here of 11 grounds, such as the perfect, of, of perfect joy or the joyous, is based on the, on the following passage in Precious Garland, the Ratnavali where a broad presentation of the 10 or 11 grounds is given. So what does that mean, 10 or 11 grounds? Mikhail, do you know what the 11 grounds are? We, we talked previously about the 10 grounds. Mikhail, are you there? Do you hear me? Buddhahood is... You're breaking up a little bit. Okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, sorry. Uh... Yeah. Buddhahood, Buddhahood would be the 11. Right. So generally, when we talk about the 10 grounds, the first ground starts at the path of seeing when one is an Arya being. And successively, when you're on the 10th ground, you're still a Bodhisattva. Almost a Buddha, you know, almost in the, you know, you know, uh, difficult to, to, to discern from a Buddha, but definitely not a Buddha. Those are those ten grounds are all on the Arya uh, Bodhisattva level. Uh, the eleventh ground, that is the achievement of the result of Buddhahood, is sometimes posited as the eleventh ground. So, the explanation here of eleven grounds, such as the as the joyous, or Jimpa translates perfect joy, 
is based on the following passage in Precious Garland. Just as eight Shravaka grounds are taught in the Shravaka vehicle, 10 Bodhisattva grounds are found in the great vehicle, in the Mahayana. So what are the eight Shravaka grounds? Does anyone know? See someone nodding? I want to see. Nadine, do you know the eight Shravaka grounds? I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> no, good, 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 good. good. Snehi, do you know? You look like you're about to say. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. But Kristen wait, had her hand up, so she might know. Oh, Kristen, okay, Kristen. What are the eight Shravaka grounds? Um, lineage is the first. Then eighth, which I didn't understand when I read it, but it's the eighth level of a person. So counting. what are you? What are you? What are you referring to? You're from Jeffrey Hopkins' translation. Well, I looked it up when I was reading ahead, and okay. so I looked it up. So this is what I found in my research, and also there's a a footnote in the back that tells too. But I was reading about it, and I got lineage, the eighth level of the person. And these are all the, you know, along the path, then seeing, and then thinning of obscurations on the path, and then freedom from attachment, uh -huh. cognizing what is done, and then the two final arhat stages, Shravaka and Pratya, Pratya Pratyaka Buddha. Yeah, this is so generally when we talk about it, like in the Hinayana scriptures, they take. They talk about the eight boomies, also. Okay, so we, they're they're meaning something different in the Mahayana. When we talk about the 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 ten boomies, or if you want to say eleven boomies, they start from the path of seeing. But in the Shravaka uh, interpretation of things, so we talk about these eight levels. So here's um, in in Hopkins text. Uh, he's quoting from uh, Konchok Jigme Wangpo's uh, tenets, I think. Is it tenets? No, presentation of the grounds and paths. So he says, the level of seeing the wholesome, which is called the hearer path of accumulation, this being the initial attainment of pure phenomena. So the Shravaka path of accumulation means that once they have developed spontaneous renunciation, they've entered into the Hinayana path or the Shravaka path, and they are on the path of accumulation. That's called the, that's called the first Bhumi. So this is much different than the Mahayana Bhumis, right? Mahayana Bhumis start at the path of seeing. You've already realized emptiness. We don't talk about the path of accumulation of the Bodhisattva as being one of the, the Bhumis. Then the level of lineage uh, that's the second one here of, the, of these eight, which is the hearer path of preparation or the hearer path of connection. Remember the in Tibetan, we say jorlam. Jorwa can mean to prepare. It can also mean to connect. So you're, you're preparing for the path of seeing or it's the path that connects you to the path of seeing. That's the second path, the level of lineage or the, the, uh, the lineage bumi. Then the level of the eighth or the eighth bumi, uh, what that means is the hero realization of approaching stream enterer, the attainment of the first of the eight levels of approaching and abiding in the fruits of stream enterer, once returner, never returner, and foe destroyer. Arhat. So, what does that mean? The eighth. So, when we talk about uh, the arias. We we say that there are uh, four kinds of arias, right? Stream enterer, stream enterer, once returner, non returner, and arhat. Have you heard that before, Karen? Have you heard that before? Stream enterer once returner, non-returner, and so forth. So each of those stages has two parts. That, that's, so there are eight. So there's 
someone who has uh, entered into stream enterer and someone who, or who, someone who is entering into stream enterer and someone who is abiding in the fruit of stream enterer. So approaching or entering into stream enterer is not the same as abiding in the fruit of stream enterer. Then there is a, a approaching or entering into once returner and abiding in the fruit of once returner. And uh, same thing with non-returner, approaching and abiding in the fruit. And then in, in terms of arhat, approaching arhatship means you're just on the cusp of that. You're not quite an arhat and then abiding in the fruit of arhat. So if you, if you count backwards from arhatship down to the beginning, that first, that eighth one is called the uh, level of the eighth. So it's, it's referring to those eight kinds of arias. Generally we say four kinds of arias, but when you talk about approaching and abiding in the fruit of them, each of them has two, so there's eight stages. Following? Snay, are you okay? Paul? You've heard that before. Yeah. David? Are you asleep? Oh, okay. I'm just checking. You look like you were asleep. You look like you were <laughs> Okay. So just as the eight Shravaka grounds are taught in the Shravaka vehicle, 10 Bodhisattva uh, grounds are found in the great vehicle. So you can find an, an, a note 109 in Jimpa's text, or if you look in Jeffrey Hopkins' text, it talks about these eight Shravaka grounds. Chandrakirti also bases his presentation on the 10 ground sutra, the Dashabhumi sutra or Dashabhumika. Have you heard of that before? Dash, Dasha means 10, right? Dashabhumika. So, the ten, the ten uh, bumis, the sutra of the ten bumis. So this is a very important Mahayana text that Chandrakirti quotes very, very much. Uh, it is a sutra, as opposed to like the the text by Nargajuna and Arya Deva and Chandrakirti and, and so forth. They they do quote sutras, those texts. And we were talking about those earlier that they they all agree as to the structure of the path. The Dashabhumika or the Dashabhumi Sutra, the, ten, the Sutra of the Ten Grounds, is something that was taught by the Buddha, and it is quoted quite extensively in the Bajamaka Vatara, especially when you reach the the grounds. There's always a quote from the the Dash the the Ten Bhumi Sutra. Chandrakirti also braises, bases his presentation and the Ten Ground Sutra. Here, the, the characteristic of the Ten Grounds, such as perfect joy, or as Jeffrey translates, the joyous, the joyous one, that's the first Bhumi, it's called the, the joyous one. Here, the characterization of the Ten Grounds, such as the first ground, perfect joy, as the Ten Awakening Minds, must be understood in terms of the ultimate awakening mind. Jeffrey says, when Chandrakirti describes the 10 grounds, the very joyful and so forth as 10 mind generations. So we've, we've had that term before, mind generation. Um, in Tibetan, semke. So like, for instance, some of you have memorized that definition of bodhicitta, remember? Semke pani shendon chir yangdak sokbe jangchub de. Oh, Violet was, was reciting along with me. Were you reciting that? Oh, good for you. you know. So semke is a synonym of bodhicitta. It's, it's a different word, uh, but it refers to the same thing. So here, each of the of the levels of these bumis are called uh, by the name uh, semke, 
or, or mind generation. Here, um, Jimpa says 10 awakening minds, but that almost sounds like 10 bodhicittas. They're actually called 10 mind generations, 10 semke. So we say semke dangpo, semke nipa, and so forth, the first semke. So what's that referring to? Here, the character characteristic, uh, the characterization of the 10 grounds as the 10 uh, mind generations must be understood in terms of the ultimate awakening mind. Not, not conventional ones. When Chandrakirti describes the 10 grounds of very joyful and so forth as 10 mind generations, he is referring to ultimate mind generations, not conventional ones. So when we talk about mind generation or bodhicitta, on the path of accumulation and the path of preparation, your bodhicitta is conventional bodhicitta, right? You don't have ultimate bodhicitta. You don't have ultimate mind generation, right? What is ultimate mind generation? What is ultimate bodhicitta? It's the realization of emptiness within the continuum of someone who has conventional bodhicitta. So the Shravakas and the Pratika Buddhas don't have ultimate bodhicitta. Could you repeat that again, please, a lot of what you mentioned? Yeah, I can try. Uh, here, what's what's being talked about when it's when you're talking about um, the the um, the ten grounds, right? So that's starting from the path of seeing, assuming you've already realized emptiness directly, right? So that first ground is given the name as first mind generation. It's not talking about a conventional mind generation that you would find or a conventional bodhicitta that you would find on the path of accumulation or path of preparation. It's assuming already uh, that you understand the these 10 mind generations are ultimate mind generations. That means that they are the realizations of emptiness held within the uh, the continuum of a person who has conventional bodhicitta. Is it getting too complicated? You following? Venerable Tendron, you okay? No? Venerable Palmo, are you st are you there? Are you following? I'm not sure where Venerable Palmo is. She's where is she? And hi, you following? You have you can press your space bar to unmute. Oh yeah, right, right. Half and half, not completely. Not completely, but you're you're, no. you're getting something. So it's it's worthwhile going back and reading this again later while it's at, when the explanation is still in your mind. So Chandrakirti also bases his presentation on the 10 ground sutra, sutra of the 10 grounds. Here, the characteriz characterization of the 10 grounds, the joyous and so forth, as 10 awakening minds, or more precisely, the 10 mind generations, must be understood in terms of ultimate awakening mind ultimate bodhicitta. The commentary characterizes the nature of the 10 grounds as the ultimate awakening mind in the following. The commentary, that means the, the basham, the Chadrakirti's auto commentary, characterizes the nature of the 10 grounds as the ultimate awakening mind in the following. And the quotation says, when the uncontaminated gnosis, wisdom, of bodhisattvas, which is sustained by compassion, which is held by compassion, right, and so on, is divided in terms of its facets, it acquires the name ground, for it constitutes the locus of qualities. A little bit, sometimes Dupta and Jimpa's, 
eloquence sometimes makes it more sound more complicated. Jeffrey says, when a bodhisattva's uncontaminated wisdom, so uh, Jimpa says gnosis, right? He's talking about this exalted wisdom, gnosis. When a bodhisattva's uncontaminated gnosis conjoined with compassion and so forth is divided into parts, okay, parts rather than going facets, each part is called a ground because it is a base of qualities. Chimpa says locus of qualities. This is the base of qualities. Generally, when we talk about bumi, ground, bumi is a Sanskrit word. What does it mean? Do you know in, in Shankar, what does what does bumi mean? And when you talk about it, it mean it means exactly that ground or earth, for example. The word for right. earth is also also bumi. You know, right, right, right. So, so why are the the shravaka grounds and the bodhisattva grounds, bodhisattva bumis, and, and we talked about the sh the eight shravaka bumis. Why are they called grounds? Because they are the basis from which you can grow qualities. In the same way that the earth, the bumi, that you know, you or if you look in the Sanskrit dictionary, that's generally what bumi means. It means earth, right, or ground. So, the, like the ground is the basis from which you can grow crops. They can come up from it. The the boomies are, you know, the the basis of qualities. Okay, rather than saying the locus of qualities, I don't know why. It does you know you to say boomy is a little more clear? Shnehi, what do you think? I should ask oh, you I... some great questions. Also, you you you're, you have Indian heritage, right? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, when it says uncontaminated gnosis, even I, I didn't, I didn't think that until it was eighth stage that it was uncontaminated. So the no. eighth Pumi. No, so uncontaminated, you know, as soon as you realize emptiness directly on the first Bhumi, during that meditation session, you have the first example, first instance of uncontaminated gnosis, uncontaminated wisdom. As soon as you arise from that, uh, your mind is, uh, what appears to you, conventionalities appear, and your mind uh, still has grasping at them as being inherently existent in the post-meditation session. So that's not uncontaminated. And on the eighth Bhumi, once you've reached the eighth Bhumi, you've eliminated all uh, grasping to inherent existence. Same thing at, at like a Hinayana Arhat. You've eliminated all of the grasping to inherent existence. So even in the post-meditation session, although phenomena are appearing to you as inherent existence, you don't grasp grasp to them as inherently existent. So you would have uncontaminated gnosis even in the post-meditation on the eighth. But you do have. Uh, uncontaminated gnosis, uncontaminated wisdom from the, during the meditative uh, equipoise, directly realizing emptiness on the first boomy, the second boomy, and so forth. Okay. Thank you for that, the clarification. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Yep. So when uncontaminated gnosis of bodhisattvas, which is sustained by compassion and so on, is divided in terms of its facets or its parts, it acquires the name of the name ground for it constitutes the basis of the, of qualities, okay? I like the word basis better because we're talking about the, the etymology of Bhumi. Sean, what do you think? I just wanted to ask, so if someone has a direct realization of emptiness, if, it, if that doesn't eliminate um the grasping at inheriting existence does that mean that it's, it's temporary like it's like this temporary realization and then you kind of get caught back up into 
Okay, we have to go back to remi remind ourselves. When you realize emptiness directly, you haven't abandoned all grasping to inherit existence completely. You've abandoned a little portion of it the first time. On the path of the seeing, uh, on the path of seeing, in the first Bhumi, when you realize emptiness directly, as for the first time, right? You eliminate, you abandon all intellectually formed delusions. You don't, you haven't abandoned any of the innate delusions or klesha, but you have abandoned all of the intellectually formed ones. On, this, on the uh, succeeding boomies, the second boomy, the third boomy, and so forth, in your meditative equipoise on emptiness, because they are now supported by a greater accumulation of merit that you've practiced when you're not meditating on emptiness. You, you practice generosity, you, uh, you benefit sentient beings, you make offerings to the gurus and serve the gurus and so forth. Because of the, that accumulation of merit, based on your previous realization of emptiness on the first Bhumi, now you have, when you have an, another direct realization of emptiness on the second Bhumi, that is able to eliminate another sliver, another portion of grasping to true existence. These first ones are the you know, are, are innate uh, grasping to true existence, but not all the innate grasping to true existence. It comes in parts, in, you know, in portions. Then on the third Bhumi, because you've accumulated more merit, your mind is more powerful, you've meditated on emptiness again, and you're able to eliminate more. So once you get to the, the, uh, the seventh Bhumi, and you on your on the uh, yeah during that you eliminate the the an, another portion of those then when you enter into equipoise on the eighth bumi uh, that is the antidote to all the last sliver that's still left the last portion of grasping to true existence that's still there so when you arise from that and you're on the eighth bumi you are now you could say a Mahayana Arhat. You've eliminated all of the grasping to inherent existence. So phenomena still appear to you as inherently existent on the, on the eighth, ninth, and tenth Bhumis, but you don't grasp to them as inherently existent. It's different for the, this, the eighth, ninth, and tenth Bhumi Bodhisattvas than the illusion-like meditation like on the first Bhumi, second Bhumi, and so forth, you meditate on emptiness, you arise from that, phenomena appear as inherently existent, but because of your realization of emptiness, it, it kind of, the, the, it's almost as though they appear to be illusions. You still have gr some grasping to them as inherently existent, as inherently existent, uh, but on the eighth, ninth, and tenth Bhumis, they appear as inherently existent, and, but you, you no longer have any grasping to them at all as being inherently existent. But is, is someone that achieves one of these states, are they going to recognize that, hey, I've, I've achieved the first Bhumi? Oh, yeah. You know, it's like it surprises you. Like, oh, I didn't know I'd achieved the first Bhumi. No, no, you know, you know, this is a sequential process. When you've realized this directly, uh, you have no thought during that meditative equipoise, right? There's no thinking, oh, I made it. It's only subsequently to that uh, that you have uh, the, the realization, oh, I realized emptiness directly. Uh, that's the case with all of them. Uh, in the meditative equipoise on emptiness, there is no uh, intellectual process going on, you know, conceptualization going on. Oh, this is emptiness. This is what emptiness is like. I've realized emptiness. Nothing occurs. All that occurs to your mind 
is a mere vacuity. Okay. Let's go on a little bit. So in the above, so this is talking about the, it says, when uncontaminated gnosis of bodhisattvas, uh, which is sustained by compassion and so on, is divided into terms of its parts or facets, it acquires the name of ground, for it constitutes the basis or locus of qualities that will develop on that ground. In the above, the ground, uncontaminated gnosis, is explained through four factors. Jeffrey says the four topics by which a ground, the grounds are explained, much more straightforward, uh, are its nature. When we talk about each of the grounds, when we get into the Arya grounds, which we're about to do in the coming weeks, we talk about the first Bhumi, we're going to talk about that for some time. There are always these four factors that are talked about. So we talk about its nature. what sustains it thoroughly, Jeffrey translates, the qualities with which they are thoroughly conjoined. I'm not sure what Jimpa is getting at when it says what sustains it thoroughly. Third is the, uh, the how it acquires the name ground or the way, the way in which they are called grounds. And then fourth, the etymology of its name. So for instance, the first Bhumi is called the joyous. So what's the, why is it called the joyous? That would be uh, the joyous one. So there's always these four factors. Nature, uh, Jimpa says what sustains it thoroughly, Jeffrey translates that as qualities which, with which they are thoroughly conjoined how it acquires the name ground and the etymology of its name. So this will be the same in all of the 10 grounds. So some people, meaning in particular, uh, Jayananda, some people, Jayananda explains the nature of uncontaminated gnosis using the definition found in the treasury of Abhidharma. Some of you who did some of our previous courses will know that treasury of, of Abhidharma is the Abhidharma Kosha, right? Composed by Vasubandhu. Vasubandhu was a Sangha's brother, right? Or you say half brother, they had different mother, they had different fathers, they had the same mother, different fathers, I guess you say half brothers. So uh, Vasubandhu wrote this Abhidharma Kosha. Kosha, can mean like a, like the thing you put a sword in or a knife in, the sheath, or it can mean treasury where you put jewels. So it's kind of like repository. So the, the treasury of Abhidharma, um, in there he explained the what, according to the Vaibhashikas, what uncontaminated meant. So uncontaminated uh, has a particular meaning for them, which is not accepted by the Prasangika only part of it. So for them, uh, say for instance, uh, for the Abhidharma Kosha, the Buddha's body is not uncontaminated. Did you know that? Paul, did you know that? For them, it, so it sounds familiar. I yeah, it sounds familiar. <laughs> so for instance, yeah, because it's the remnant uh, that's left, you know, the, the Buddha's same body was there when he was meditating that was that was thrown by karma, contaminated karma. So it was contaminated and it remains yeah. contaminated. And I think this is the, the difference between uh, nirvana within without remainder, which are some, different some, between the lower tenants and the higher and, tenants. Yeah, connection with that also. So uh, according to Abhidharma Kosha, uh, something is contaminated if it is conducive by, by observing it, uh, it is conducive to the generation of delusions. So uh, the Buddha's body, if one saw the Buddha's body according to them, because it's contaminated, uh, it's possible to have attachment for the body 
or you know, uh, anger or something like that. Some explain the nature of uncontaminated gnosis using the definition found in, in the treasury of Abhidharma, the Abhidharma Kosha, in terms of not suitable for enhancing con contamination. So uncontaminated, something is contaminated if it, if it is conducive uh, for the generation of delusions, clicious, uncontaminated if it is not conducive or not suitable for enhancing contamination or in this case, uh, delusions. This suggests a lack of understanding of the unique meaning of what it means to be uncontaminated according to this system of Chandrakirti. Okay, so I'll, I'll read you what Jeffrey says. So in accordance with Vasubandhu's treasury of knowledge, or, you know, Abhidharma Kosha, where is it? Some persons, Jayananda and some Tibetans, explain the nature of uncontaminated wisdom as uncontaminated in the sense of not being amenable or conducive or suitable to the increase of contaminations. So, for instance, for the Abhidharma Kosha, if you, in your meditative equipoise, on emptiness directly, when you're directly realizing emptiness, that would be an uncontaminated mind, right? When you're out of that, uh, that situation, that would be a contaminated mind because it's, it would be suitable uh, within that mind when you're not realizing emptiness directly, it would be suitable to generate delusions, klesha within that or other contaminations, okay? Usually in Tibetan, we say, uh, and I can't remember the Sanskrit, maybe Paul does, we say sakche. What is the Sanskrit, Paul, for sakche, do you remember? And sakme means uncontaminated. Yeah, it's... Um, uh, it'll come to you. Yeah, it'll come to me. <laughs> <laughs> so... Sak sometimes is translated as fall. So sometimes they say with fall, sak che. Che means together with, or we could say contaminated. Sak may means no sak, no contamination or uncontaminated. Some people translate it as with fall, as a, you know, from the turn of the last century when they're trying to translate these things in English. So, um, They have not understood the uncommon meaning of uncontaminated in this system, in Chattrakirti system. In our own system, our own position is this. What is contaminated is tainted or polluted either by ignorance grasping a true existence or by the imprints of such ignorance. contaminated, uncontaminated. Our own position is this, what is contaminated is tainted either by ignorance grasping at true existence or the, the imprints of such, such ignorance. So that implies you don't say that outer phenomena are contaminated, only minds are contaminated or uncontaminated. It only applies to minds, right? You wouldn't say the Buddha's body is contaminated as the Abhidharma Kosha, you know, as, as, the, as the Vaibhashikas say. The gnosis free of such taint is uncontaminated. So that means in meditative equipoise, realizing emptiness directly, you have no um, ignorance grasping a true existence. The ignorance is gone because you have the wisdom realizing emptiness, right? So that's, the, that's exactly opposite of grasping to true existence. And you don't even, at that point, the imprints of that ignorance is not manifest. So that, that is an uncontaminated mind. 
This is as stated in Chandrakirti's clear words, the prasana pada, uh, or clearly worded. You can translate prasana pada as clearly worded. The uh, one author who has translated that the first chapter of that took the text, Anne McDonald. Uh, you can find this, maybe a PDF of this or, the, or this text. Uh, she translated Prasanna Pada as in clear words. I like that. You know, you say, you know, please explain to me in clear words, right? So Prasanna Pada, or explain to me like I'm a six year old or a five year old or something like that. So uh, this, the way that Chimpa translates this, I think, is incorrect. And the way that Jeffrey has it uh, is correct. And it's, it's uh, verified by the Tibetan and by Anne McDonald's translation. Anyway, Jimpa says, from the perspective of the nature that is the object of uncontaminated gnosis, free of the obscuring cataract of ignorance. And then he has in parentheses uh, brackets, things do not exist. So Jeffrey has it this way. He, he, he says, he, he, this, this quotation from Prasanapada, not from the viewpoint. So the not is taken at the beginning of the sentence where, where Tupten Chippa has it at the end of the sentence, but he has it in brackets, but it's, it's part of the sentence. It's not talking about things do not exist. It says, not from the viewpoint of the nature of the objects of uncontaminated wisdom in those free from the obscurations of ignorance. Or as um, Chimpa says, cataract of ignorance. So you, sometimes you see in the, in the text talking about the cataract of ignorance. Have you run across that before in some texts? You seen that? Snehi's nodding. Mikhail, Mikhail? Stephen, yeah. Stephen, have you heard? Have you run across that term, the cataract of ignorance? Uh, yes, I have, Venerable George. Okay, and I've also heard it described as sort of, I guess, uh, something falling in front of the eyes. Yeah. So there's a little bit of uh, sort of misinterpretation here. The the. the Sanskrit and Tibetan term doesn't mean cataract. Cataract, like I had cataract surgery. They take off the lens off of your eye that has been uh, occluded by, you know, uh, various substances so that you can't see as well. This is referring to uh, a, a a problem with the eyes, sometimes associated with what what is what we call uh, what do we call the fallers? Not fallers. What do they call? Floaters. 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 <laughs> so you know what floaters are? Richard, do you know what floaters yeah, are? Yeah, I've got them. Yeah. You got them. Yeah, yeah I got right. them. Too. It, it looks like there's something floating around. Uh, we all have them. We all have them, yeah. So, um, so it, at any rate, so Ed McDonald translates this in this in this way. In this regard, these, the rising and so forth, asserted for dependent arising, have not been asserted with, referen with reference to a purported own being of the object of uncontaminated gnosis of those persons whose timira, so timira is the Sanskrit word here for what people sometimes translate as cataract. It means some fault of seeing. Rather, they are stated with reference to the object of cognition of those beings whose minds are, whose mind's eye is impaired by the timira of ignorance. So what is this saying? You know, even those words it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, Venerable. That's not very in clear words. Yeah, right. Her, her, 
<laughs> that's Sue. That she she was tra she translated prasanna pada, pada as in clear words. It didn't sound like in clear words, right? Okay. So what's 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 taking place here? In this quotation that Lama Sunkapa is quoted, is quoting, and he's quoting it. Um, I don't know if this is in Chandrakirti, uh, in, in the Majamaka Vatara. He's, he's, he's quoting Chandrakirti's other commentary, right? The two commentaries that, that Chandrakirti wrote on about fundamental wisdom by Nargajuna. One is the Majamaka Vatara, which is the meaning commentary. And the other is the Prasanna Pada, clearly worded or clear words or in clear words which is the uh, word commentary. So he, he, he comments on every word of fundamental wisdom in order, all of, this, all of the verses and everything, <clears throat> whereas in the Majamakvatara, it's not quoted all of the verses of fundamental wisdom and not commented on, it's just talking about the general meaning of, the, of uh, fundamental wisdom. So in Chandrakirti's Prasanapada, it says, uh, or I'll, I'll read what Jeffrey says here. Not from the viewpoint of the nature of objects of uncontaminated wisdom in those free from the obscurations or the timura of ignorance. So what is this talking about? Uh, the, the quotation I read from Anne McDon McDonald's translation was giving the context. Sometimes I found over the years in translating and trying to understand these texts, if some quotation is given, it's worthwhile going back to find that quotation context and see what was talked about just before that. To see what it's talking about. So, so this is not in not from the perspective of the nature of the object. What is not? So Ann McDonald's is giving the, the in that you can find uh, pages 159 to 160 if you happen to be able to get that book. Uh, this is her translation of the first chapter of Prasanna Pada, which is incredible. We don't have anything as clear. She says, in this regard, so what was being talked about in just before this quotation was talking about uh, the rising and so forth asserted for dependent arising. So he's talking about dependent arisings. That means conventional, you know, de dependent, all phenomena are dependent arisings, but also conventional phenomena, because all phenomena are dependent arisings, conventional phenomena are dependent arisings. So they rise and they fall and so forth. Um, those statements about, about dependent arisings have not been asserted with reference to a theoretical, you know, and a, a purported svabhava nature, you know, inherent existence of uncontaminated gnosis of those persons whose timira, if you want to say cataract or obscuration of ignorance has vanished. Rather, they are stated with reference to the object of cognition of those beings whose minds, eyes are impaired by the Timira of ignorance. So even that is not so clear. From the perspective, so th this quotation is saying, not from the viewpoint of the nature of objects of uncontaminated wisdom in those free from the obscurations of ignorance. So what he's what he's talking about here is the meaning of uncontaminated. What uncontaminated means? It doesn't mean, as in the Abhidharma Kosha, that which is conducive to the generation of delusions and so forth, so that even the Buddha's body would be would be contaminated. Uh, uncontaminated means, from the perspective of the object, from the from the nature from the perspective of the nature of uncontaminated gnosis. So we should put the, the word not at the beginning, not from the perspective of the nature 
that is the object of uncontaminated gnosis, free of uh, the obscuring cataract of ignorance. So what 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 he was what he was talking about there, what Chandrakirti was talking about in context, he was talking about dependent arisings, you know, the conventional phenomena. He's saying they are being uh, posited not from the perspective of the nature that is the object of uncontaminated gnosis, free of ignorance. So they are not being posited ordinary phenomena are not being posited from the point of view of uncontaminated gnosis, meditative equipoise and emptiness. Okay, some people thinking, some people sleeping. Kristen, what are you thinking? No, okay, that's good. I know that that that's, there's an emo famous emoji like that. I don't know. Right. So, what is, what what this is saying? So it 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 it's, it it uh, it surprises me that Lama Tsongkhapa didn't put the previous the context of this so that you could kind of understand. But anyway, uh, so uh, just one, one minute, Shanga. Until the attainment of the Buddha's ground. The only mental state not tainted or polluted by imprints of ignorance is the non-conceptual gnosis of an aria, the direct realization of emptiness of an aria being in meditative equipoise. That's the only mental state not tainted by the imprints of ignorance. And the Buddha state, all of the Buddha state, none of the Buddhas. Uh, mind states, mental states are polluted by the imprints of ignorance. But for their ordinary, until that ground, until, until achieving enlightenment, the only mental state not polluted by imprints of ignorance is the non-conceptual gnosis of an aria in meditative equipoise. Such gnosis comes about only intermittently or as Jeffrey says, alternately, for when, an ar when arias arise from their meditative equipoise, their mental states once again are tainted by the imprints of ignorance. That means, what, what are those imprints of ignorance? So there, there are seeds of ignorance and there are imprints of ignorance, right? Do you know the difference? Ron, do you know the difference between seeds of ignorance and imprints of ignorance? Um, I, yeah, I do, but I, I wouldn't be able to articulate it. Yeah. Okay. I thought, I thought you were going to say, I don't, I don't want to say right now in this company. <laughs> so, that too. <laughs> so seeds of ignorance are what give rise to ignorance, or say seeds of anger. Are, are what we have. We say sabon in Tibetan. Uh, if you have the seed of anger in your mind, when you, read, when you encounter the right circumstances of someone giving you a hard time, uh, anger can rise. That's called the, the seeds of ignorance. Imprints of ignorance are deeper. Imprints of ignorance is even if you were to eliminate the seeds of ignorance, you still have imprints of those. Um, and you still have imprints of that. So the imprints of ignorance is what cause the appearance of true existence. The imprints of ignorance are what we call the obstructions to um, among the obstructions to omniscience. There are many obstructions to omniscience. We remember we talked about different things, the obstructions to liberation, which are what? Nadine, do you know the uh, obstructions to liberation? There are cognitive obstructions and the other one, more like 
emotional, I'm not sure, okay, liberation. So obstru uh, obst obstructions to liberation, we say intellectually formed, maybe you say emotional, and innate. So those, in general, what are they? What are the obstructions to liberation? You remember? No, ignorance, um, ignorance yeah. about how things exist. The, so not only ignorance, all of the delusions, so all the kleshas and the seeds of those, those are called the obstructions to liberation. So once you've, re, once you've achieved nirvana or liberation, you've liberated, you've eliminated all of the klesha and their seeds. So, you know, right now you might have some klesha in your mind, but all the rest of the klesha are still present in the form of potentiality, in the form of seeds, right? So once you've meditated on emptiness and achieved nirvana, you've eliminated all of the klesha and the seeds of klesha, but you haven't eliminated the imprints of the klesha, or the imprints, or you say the imprints of the seeds. The imprints are something much more subtle, like the example of, uh, you know, famous example, if you have a, a, a bowl in which you're, um, you're mixing up garlic, you know, crushing it for some nice Italian sauce. And uh, you, afterwards, you clean out all of the garlic and you even wash it out. If you smell that bowl later, it may still smell garlicky, right? There's some imprint sort of into the stone bowl or the ceramic bowl of that. Uh, so the imprints of ignorance, the in imprints of the delusions in general, but the imprints of ignorance are what cause the appearance of inherent existence. I think I might have misspoken earlier. So a, a, a person on the uh, eighth, ninth, and tenth boomies, they still have the, the imprints of grasping the true existence. They have eliminated all the seeds. They, they've eliminated the grasping and the seeds of the grasping. So the grasping won't occur, but there's still that smell or that imprint of that grasping that causes phenomena to appear as inherently existent when they're not in meditative equipoise and emptiness. So until the attainment of the Buddha's ground, the only mental state not tainted by the imprints of ignorance is the non-conceptual gnosis of an aria in meditative equipoise. Such gnosis comes about only intermittently or alternately, for when an aria arises from their meditative equipoise, when arias arise from the meditative equipoise, so this, this includes the impure grounds, the one through seven and eight, nine, and 10, the pure, pure grounds, when they arise from their meditative equipoise, their mental states are once again, once again tainted by the imprints of ignorance. So on the first seven boomies, your mind is, is polluted or tainted by the seeds and the imprints. And on the eighth, ninth, and tenth boomies, your mind is not, you know, because you've already eliminated the delusions and their seeds, they're not polluted or uh, what is it? What did he call here? You know. Uh, tainted by uh, the seeds of the delusions, they're, but they're still tainted by the imprints of the delusions, by the, the imprint of ignorance. The taint or pollution of ignorance exists up until the seventh ground. That means the taint of ignorance. That means the actual delusion, the klesha. The taint of ignorance exists up until the seventh ground. The stain of ignorance. This is the, the taint of ignorance. That means that you know the pollution that, 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 that is polluting your mind of ignorance itself and its seeds exists through the seventh ground. The stain of ignorance, the imprint of ignorance, excel. It, 
itself disappears for those on the eighth ground and up, as well as on the stain of ignorance. No, that's not right. Not the imprint of ignorance. The stain of ignorance. That must mean that, how does Jeffrey say here? Jeffrey says, up to and on the seventh ground, pollution can occur through ignorance. Right? However, for bodhisattvas on the eighth ground, as well as for hearer and solitary realizer foe destroyers, polluting ignorance has been extinguished as well as the seeds of that. Therefore, pollution occurs for them not by way of ignorance or the seeds of ignorance, but through the predisposing latencies of ignorance or the imprints of ignorance. I, I know I'm over. Again, when the commentary refers to the first ground as that which bears the name of non-dual wisdom, it's saying that the gnosis is free from dual, dualistically perceiving subject and object as separate from each other. It is not referring merely to a gnosis free of the two extremes. Okay, so we're going to stop there. That's where we're going to begin again next time. Okay. Highlight. Okay. Sorry, no, that's right. So confusing class today. Anyone have any question that they can articulate? <laughs> Would you mind um, at the beginning of next session just reviewing this last paragraph or two, please? Yes, yes, of course. I try to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, my, my caffeine has begun to wear off. Okay, yeah, mine, mine too, yeah. Um, so, what do I want to do here? Okay. So this is a little bit complicated. And uh, if you happen to have access, if you're interested in going to more detail, you can look for Anne McDonald's uh, translation. It's volume two. She it, it, Volume one was her, what is called a, a critical edition of the Prasanna Pada. I think both in Sanskrit and, in, and Tibetan. And the second volume was her translation of the first chapter um, that can help, but that gives a little, so what, it, what it's talking about, when we talked about uncontaminated here, uncontaminated gnosis, that means uh, that's not contaminated by the seeds or imprints of ignorance. That only occurs for people who are not Buddha in the meditative equipoise that directly realizing emptiness. Shanka, you have a thought. Oh, Sean asked, yeah. what is her name again? What did I say? Uh, Anne, A-N-N-E, MacDonald, like old MacDonald, M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. Her, her translation is called In Clear Words. And this is volume two, the English, the English translation. So Shanka, you had a question. Yeah, you can, you can download it from JSTOR. But in any case, um, what I was going to ask is, uh, so in, in this paragraph where we had the term, so it said the taint of ignorance exists up to until the seventh ground. Um, then it says the stain of ignorance is still disappears. So the stain here is the same as imprint. Is that correct? Is that what we're talking about? Because he he introduces this word stain suddenly and never right, uses right. it again. Right. Let me just go back here. So, so Jeffrey translates this as up to and on the seventh ground. Uh, up to, usually they say up to, that would mean the sixth, right? So up to and on the seventh ground, pollution can occur through ignorance. So the, the consciousness is colluded, is pol colluded, polluted by ignorance. It's something that is causing some problem, right? And it's also polluted by the seeds of ignorance, the sabum. Mm -hmm. However, for bodhisattvas on the eighth ground, right, 
as well as for, as mm. for hearer and solitary realizer arhats, polluting ignorance has been extinguished and therefore whatever pollution that still is there occurs for them not by way of ignorance or the seeds of ignorance, but through the imprints, he, uh, Jeffrey says, predisposing latencies of ignorance. So this is in Tibetan what we call bakchak, bakchak. So there are sabon and bakchak, the, the seeds and the imprints. Seeds are um, ready to give rise to the delusion, you know, the seeds of anger, the seeds of attachment and so forth. Even when you've eliminated the seeds, there's still that smell, that imprint of attachment and anger and ignorance and so forth within your mind. It doesn't cause the delusions to rise, but it contributes to the, uh, to the obstructions to omniscience because it, one, of the, one of the things that those imprints of ignorance cause is the appearance to you of inherent existence. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay. So, Rachel looks suitably wise, or is that a photo? Oh, no, okay, I thought that was a photo from it. That's it, okay, okay. you're actually, Diana, everything okay? Okay, Karen? David, okay. Don, any questions? No. You once told me, George, it's clear, intuitive clear to even the simplest mind. Oh, yeah, you remember. Uh, I think that was, uh, I was mentioning to Doris Tatry the other day that when I was at, 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 at university, Amar Bose was one of my, uh, my professors and the guy who made Bose speakers and everything like that. Uh, there was another teacher who was very, very, who taught physics and he, he used that phrase that Don remembers. I think he must remember from me mentioning it before. He, he'd write this long, long thing on the blackboard. He said, intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. You know, <laughs> as, if, as if you weren't humiliated enough not following everything. It should be intuitively obvious to the most casual observer. So, okay, enough. So, um, Snehi, I think you're now in charge. Would you put up the... Uh, the prayers, dedication prayers. Okay. By offering this ground, oh, here we go, dedication prayers. Due to these merits, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all migrators, without exception, into that enlightened state. So think of that, the meaning of that. May these merits contribute to my achieving the state of omniscience. We say Guru Buddha because, you know, there's a famous saying, the Guru is Buddha, the Guru is Dharma, the Guru is Sangha, so forth. We try to see all Buddhas as Gurus, all Gurus as Buddhas, and lead and as a result of reading, reaching that state, may I be able to lead all migrators without exception, even those that are irksome into that enlightened state. May the supreme precious, precious Buddhachitta that has not arisen, arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase evermore. And the long life prayers, thinking of Lama Zopa and uh, Roger, his attendant, who's broken his hip. You who hold the Muni's moral code, serving as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, masterfully accomplishing magnificent prayers through honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples. Please please live long. And you spiritual friends who are eyes, 
for viewing all the infinite scriptures, you know, through which I can see, you know, through your explanations, through which I can see all the infinite scriptures, supreme gateways for the fortunate beings traveling to liberation, engaging with skillful means moved by mercy, moved by love, sewa, all illuminating spiritual friends, implication, please live a long and stable life. Okay, long class, sorry. Uh, thank you for your patience. You have to go back, read. If you can find some other sources, like if you can find Jeffrey Hopkins translation um, or Ann McDonald's or the, uh, I think we provided up on the page. I think Doris put up the translation that Paul provided us of um, very kindly in, from that obscure French journal of Bhikshu Pasadita, Pasadika's translation of the, of the uh, Sutra Samuchaya. Incredible. Oh, so inspiring. If you get a chance to read that, they can fill in some of these gaps. See you next week. Be good. Thank you, Venerable.